Today's scripture reading will be in the book of Luke. So if everyone would open your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, we'll be reading verses 4 through 8. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell among the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he had said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Thanks, Bill. Well, it's good to see everyone today. Am I on? Okay, I just can't hear me. So, all right, it's good to see all you guys. I don't, I got a red light. <laughs> okay, maybe I need this one. Is that better? All right, let me try with this one. Um, when we start thinking about potential and uh, what the idea of potential means, it's something that we don't see yet. And we talk about that a lot with people is that they might have this potential and they might be able to say, well, something great's going to happen. I especially notice this with the Olympics. And that's one of those things that I think that's very important for us to see is you'll get the Olympics and the person who, they'll even tell you who's going to win, especially the person from USA, of course. And they'll have this clip, and they'll have all this background, they'll have all this stuff, because they were able to look at the potential, and they were able to see the things that were going on. And so, sure enough, it'd be where, okay, our guy won, yay for us, and, and we did all this stuff, and it was great, and it was one, except for sometimes they get surprises, and potential doesn't always work, and so they've got all this background stuff on this guy who just lost really bad. And so potential is good, but sometimes potential doesn't get fulfilled. And so I want you to realize that that's the way it talks about it sometimes, is potential is great, but potential is not reality. Potential doesn't mean it got accomplished, but it is certainly there. As we look at Jesus and at his teaching, one of the things that he does with potential is he talks about these parables. And parables are about the fact that this is what can happen. This is what could be good. And so he talks about this idea of potential. He tells a story about a house that was built on the sand. Okay, that's a good story and the house that was built on the rock. Well, the one on the sand crashes. The one on the rock stays. So what's the point? If I get a house that I built on the sand and I'm halfway through, how do I fix it, Jesus? Well, you can't. Well, why not? I mean, isn't that what you're here for, is to tell me how to fix it, how to change my life so that now it'll all be better and the point is, no, you have to go back to the beginning, completely rebuild the whole house. So the parable was there for you to look ahead to get the result that you want. And in order to do that, you have to look way ahead. You can't just say, all right, how do I fix it now? So wherever you are now... I think this is one of those times where we're able to look ahead and say, where do I want to be? How do I get it to work? What's going to make it work? And so let's think about that as we talk about some of these things about this parable. We've been talking about conforming to the heart of Jesus, and he gives us ways to do that. 
I think this parable is one of the best ones for this. I know you already know this parable. It's, it's a fairly common one. But let's look at some of the things that it says and what this really means for us. The parable is about a sower and about what happens with that. So as we look at this, a lot of times this gets told as if some of you are bad, some of you are mediocre, some of you just have no help at all, there's nothing we could do for you, but then there's a few that are going to be good, and we always hope that we're the good ones. What if this isn't about the soil at all? Because he doesn't say that. That's not what he says is some of you are bad, some of you are good. We are all soil. That's just it. And when we look at people and we think about the people, the people are good. Now, some of them have got problems in their life. Some of them have got blessings in their life. Some of them have got other things going on, but it doesn't make that person a bad person. It doesn't make them where they cannot get to Jesus at all. And so I think that's important for us to understand as we're talking about this. One of the main things that you see in this is at the very end of this, he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so that's one of those things that's important. What does he want us to do with this? He wants us to be able to hear what he's trying to say. And he's, as he's talking about this, it's about hearing the Word of God. And this whole parable is about how much we pay attention to the Word of God. Do we let the Word of God impact us? Do we let the Word of God make a real difference in our life? Because the Word of God is talked about as this powerful thing that's able to change, that's able to do something. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to really make a difference in the lives of people. And yet, do we read it? Do we listen to it? I think one of the most important things is trying to let it sink in and trying to understand it. And so, I think you need to read with a pencil. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but read with a pencil because you're going to need to write some of this down. If you go into it without a pencil, you think, well, you know, I'll just read it. I'll just forget it, right? You're not going to remember it. You already know that. And so, read it with a pencil where you know that you're going to have something to write down, and then you can at least go back and look and say, this is what it is. Some people, everybody's got ears, right? Very few people don't have ears. Even deaf people have ears. So, when he says, the one who has ears to hear, let him hear He's meaning to let it sink into your heart. Let it make a difference in your life. Let it be something that's going to be there for you that really enables you to see this. Because a lot of times you start on a Bible passage or you start a sermon and people hear, wah, 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 wah. And that's all they hear is, yeah, we're off on some Bible thing that I don't know anything out. It isn't easy to hear. I just want to start with that. It is not easy to hear because there are some words that we don't understand. And they're normal Bible words, but if we didn't grow up with those, those aren't such normal words for us anymore. There is a lot of culture you have to understand. Uh, their culture was not anything like our culture. We need to understand our culture so that we're able to do some things as well. But their culture was not like our culture. And so sometimes the things that are said are said with that background and not in our situation. There are some concepts that are difficult. On top of that, some of the Bible is prophetic, some of it's apocalyptic, and some of it just refers to things that happened a long time ago, and you're expected to know those things. So when it talks about faithless Israel, what do you mean faithless Israel? Who was that guy? Uh, you got to know the background. You need to know a little bit of the history. All of these things seem to happen under the surface. When you're talking about parables, it seems like it's under the surface. So since we're talking about planting, when you go out and you plant your garden, it 
looks something like this. You've got the sower. He's able to sow. He's able to be able to spread some seed. But then when you look at the seed that he spread or when we plant our garden, it looks more like this, right? That's what it looks like on the first day and on the second day and on the third day. And you wonder, is anything going on under there? Makes you want to kind of dig up a couple, see if anything's happening. If it's this way after six months, you can go, well, <laughs> maybe nothing happened. Because what you're waiting for is something to happen underneath the ground. You can't even see it. And I think that's a lot of what Christianity is like. It happens underneath the ground first. And then we're able to see it as it comes out in the life of people. But if you don't have it happening underneath the ground first, it's not going to come out in the lives of other people. And we look at them and we wonder, well, what happened? Where did it go wrong? Well, it's because of the unseen things that weren't there. And that's really what I think he's talking about as he talks about this whole thing. Now, sometimes we get blamed for this, and this is seen as an evangelism parable. I think this is a parable about people. And we can say it's somebody's fault, but I think this is about all of us and just about where we are. And it's really not meant to be about evangelism. This is meant to be about our own development. And so when we look at the explanation of Jesus, I think that's an important thing to see. Jesus is the sower. He's the one who goes out to sow. The seed is the word of God. Some seed falls on the path. It gets trampled underfoot. It gets eaten. It's gone. There's no hope. It's done. Some seed falls on the rocky and it grows up, but it withers because there's no moisture. Some seed falls on the thorns, and the thorns grew up. They choke it out. Some seed falls on the good soil, and it yields a hundredfold. That's the basic parable. And then he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So what do you hear in all of that? One of the best things is Jesus tells us what he meant by that. Because we can come up with a lot of things about what he meant by that, what we think it ought to mean, how we would interpret that. This is what it means, and you know what? Let's look at what Jesus says it means. That's really more to the point. So in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 9, he says, when his disciples asked him what the parable meant, which is good hope for us, right? Because they didn't get it either. It's like, well, what does this mean? He said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones who are on the rocks are those who, when they, hear the, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing fall away. As for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by cares and riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. As for what is in, as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. And so as he talks about this, he talks about the secrets of the kingdom. He says, you've been given to know the secrets of the kingdom. Okay, they're secrets. And so as he talks to the disciples, you're able to know. In fact, it's said so that people are able to know. Wouldn't you want everyone to know the secrets of the kingdom? And yet he realizes some people are not going to get it. And so how can we be those people 
who get it. We're the ones who know the secret. Well, it's just all about what's underneath the ground. It's not about what you see on top. It's about the secret of the kingdom being what happens underneath. And so I think it's conversations like this where he has recorded, here's what I meant. And that's difficult enough. Everyone hears the word of God. All of the soils hear the word of God. Every single one of them. The seed is the word of God. Every single person heard the word of God. Every single person knew what that was. And so the point is, what do we get out of what we hear? Do we get something out of it? And this is the first reason sometimes that people won't listen is, you know, he's talking about a situation where, well, yeah, we heard it. And by the time you get home today, you won't even remember what this was about. So, Let's talk about it a little bit and give you some idea. The first one, he falls on the path or on the, the road or uh, on something hard. The sea doesn't sink in. He says the devil comes and snatches it away. These are not devil birds. Uh, that's not what I was trying to say at all. But, you know, the birds come and they eat it and basically it's gone. The seed was there. They heard the Bible. They heard the gospel. They saw it, but they had no pencil. All right? That's what happened. And it just, it, it just went. They read it. They heard it. And now it just, it just didn't sink in anywhere. Their life doesn't change. They don't look like that. And, and you know, they couldn't even tell you what it was that they heard. Did you read the Bible? Yeah, I read it. Have you ever done that? Get halfway down the page and you realize you don't know anything about what you've read? Uh, you just, eyes are moving, going down, and sometimes the Bible's like that. He says you need to see it and understand what it is. So some seed falls on the path. Nothing happens without the Word of God getting into your life. That's the whole point. The Word of God has got to get into your life somehow. You've got to hear it. You've got to bring it in. You've got to break it down. It, that's the first breakdown point. If we don't get the Word of God into our life where we can see it and understand it, nothing's going to happen. It's like the garden which you've planted. It's going to be blank on top. Nothing's coming up. So we need time to be able to hear. And that's one of those things that's important. When you get to that stage where a person has just kind of had it snatched away, they heard it, but they don't know what it meant, they have to start there. You can't get further down. You have to start there. They need to go back and hear it again. Well, how are they going to do that? A lot of times it happens in some kind of tragedy. That's what you'll see, is that's when they got really serious about God is that there was a time then when something happened and they were able to see it. They were able to say, I really need to get my life right with God. They didn't know that before. I mean, they know it, but, you know, we don't have to do it yet. And so it's those kind of times when we see it the most. The second one's most important. That's the idea of rocks. They hear the word, they keep it. It enters their heart. They have joy about it. They come and they're so excited to be at church. They're excited to do everything and they're so great to be here. And there's nothing underneath. It says they have no root. There's no moisture because the rock is there. We realize that if you have tall root, tall trees, you're going to need a big root system to hold that up. There's a lot of times where it's a, just about the underneath. It's about the root that's there first. Have you seen cut flowers? They're great. We like to get flowers, tulips that open up. They're magical, right? They, it looks like it would work, doesn't it? Because after all, they get that little packet in there. 
you know, it's all about the little packet because you can take them and you can put them in water, you cut the ends off, and then that magic little packet, you put it that in and you stir your water all around, and man, they're going to last for a long time. Why do they die? It looks like they're good. In fact, you have to refill the water, right? Because they're sucking up the water and then gradually they open and they open and they open and the petals fall. And it, you know, if you still got them, they're not coming back. They're not going to get there because there's no root. It doesn't mean they can't suck up water. It doesn't mean they can't take care of the flower that's already there. And it looks great and it looks wonderful. And they are so amazing to look at and smell because they're so beautiful. They're dying. And they're not going to stay because there's no root. They don't get any taller. The water they suck up is just to be able to take care of the bulb and the flower that's already there. And a lot of times I think we're like this. We're there. We're excited. We're wonderful. We're great. But if you don't deal with the underneath, with the root part, it's not going to stay. Eventually they die. He talks about this as if it's times of testing that comes in, as if it's difficulties that come into your life. And we get temptations or we get hard things that happen in our life. Can you do anything about the hard things that happen in your life? Sometimes you can. Sometimes they were because we made bad decisions. Sometimes they were because we didn't do things right. But you know what? A lot of times it's not because we did anything wrong. It's not because of anything else at all. It's because life is hard. And there are some people who have a real difficult time with this. And so I don't know that we can blame them for it and say, well, it's your fault. You're not doing this, especially when we begin to look at some of the people in the Bible. You look at Joseph, and he was sold into slavery. He's put in prison. He's forced to be in charge of a government food program. That sounds like a nightmare to me. Uh, all kinds of things. But he had one thing. He had a vision from God that said, here's what's going to happen. All of your brothers and sisters and mother and father are going to bow down to you. And he hung on to that. He believed that. He had that word of God in his life from the very beginning. Did he make all of those hard things in his life? No. Did he fall away because of the hard things? No. Somehow he developed a root in his life that is able to make him stand Moses is a leader who has to lead a complaining bunch of people out across a desert to a new land. He tried to get out of that problem. Some problems you just cannot avoid. They are going to be in your life, and they're going to be there, and you just have to do them, and they come from God. But he has the law. He has the Word of God. He has God talking to him in his ear. And so both of them had either the word or a dream or a vision. David has got all kinds of problems in his life. He's being chased by a king after he's anointed as a king. We see the wars and the fighting and the battles that go on. But he has the word of God in his heart because he writes a lot of this. And so it's not just the word that was there for him to read, but he has the pencil. He's the one who writes it down because God is giving him this. And then we see Jesus, the time of his temptation. He's starving to death. Not Jesus' fault, even though he intentionally goes to the wilderness, but he goes there to be tempted. And every single one of his answers comes back, word of God, word of God, word of God. 
That's his answer to everything. That's how you deal with rocks, and he has this. He says the main thing, develop a root. That's what's most important. We don't always get to have good soil like this. Develop a root however you can. It's going to be much harder for the people who have greater difficulties. I don't want to condemn them. I don't want to say they'll never make it. But it's going to be much more difficult for them. And so he's giving you this to say, when you see this happen, you just realize how hard it is. Because this is a normal tendency. If you don't have the root, you don't get the rest of it. We need the root to be able to have the kind of strength we have to have to go with God. Thorns and weeds, they choke it out. They choke out anything that we had. We're just too busy. We have too many good things. We can't get out of it. And we just have to do all these things. And so when we come to church, we don't get anything out of that either. We get bored by it because there's all these other things going on. They've stolen our attention. They've taken everything away. He lists three things, cares, riches, and pleasures, those three things. Well, riches would be nice, wouldn't it? Or pleasure would be nice, but not if it's going to take you away from God. And yet each one of those things can stand in the way between us and God. What happens is they get so focused on everything else around them that, yeah, they're here. They're still coming to church, but it, it just doesn't do much for them because the Word of God isn't in their heart again. You have to study with that pencil. They just don't sound like Christians. They don't act like Christians. They don't feel like Christians when they're away from here, but they come and they try and it doesn't mean that they fall away, but it means it's just it's difficult for them because they have so much else going on. Do you ever have one of those smart kids? Yeah, me either. But some people have smart kids. And it depends on what you do with them, right? You can treat them like they're normal kids, or you can have one that you're going to, boy, this kid's going to be great. He's going to be wonderful. And you get all these coaches for them, and you get special training for them. And, you know, it's more focused on the coaching and the special training than it ever is on the Word of God. And I think that's important. We can be so smart and so gifted and so talented sometimes that we don't focus on the right thing. And so we need to be able to focus on the Word of God and on what that does for us. The blessings and the advantages sometimes are not blessings or advantages. We need to hear about the Word of God. And then the good soil, it has lots of root. It has lots of place where it's able to grow. It has lots of root that develop, and what comes up above the ground is because of what's below the ground. It's because of what you don't see. What you don't see is doing great. It's doing wonderful. They are permanent people. They have developed roots. They hang on to things. They stay with things. They are dependable. They stay firmly planted. They are not going away from Christ. And I think this is one of the things that's amazing is that some people seem to be able to have this and it's effortless. And maybe you're one of those. It just comes easy because you got the Word of God and it was there and there hasn't been any major problems and you're really not talented in anything or good at anything and, you, you know, you don't have many distractions. I guess that's a good thing. But then you're able to do all of this with the Word of God and it just grows and it's, it makes you so strong in Him. And you watch other people as they struggle. You say, well, I, I don't get it. I don't understand why. And this says he produces fruit in his life. Well, fruit like what? 
Well, the Bible talks about this all the time. It talks about all kinds of fruit. One is the fruit of the Spirit. He produces this in his life. He produces this love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because one, one of those things we're going to struggle with. We might be great at loving other people and do this really well, but that self-control when that's harder. Or we have great self-control, but we just don't like very many people. And we don't have much peace or much joy because everything's about controlling everything. And so as you look at this, it's, it, it balances all of these things as the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, this is what makes you into who God wanted you to be. Another one that we have is the Beatitudes. Blessed are. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, the merciful, those who mourn over their sin, those who are meek or gentle, those who seek and hunger for righteousness, those who are persecuted for things that are good. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are, and we develop those things. It, Jesus isn't say, blessed are, well, not you. That's not what he's meaning by that. Blessed are when you develop into this that God is giving you and allowing you to be able to get into. And then there's one more passage in this just to help balance all of this out. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he's talking about the fact that we are called by his glory and excellence, that we have precious and magnificent promises from God, that we have all of these things, that we might be partakers of the divine nature, that we might really be like God as we develop and we grow into these things because we've gotten away from sin. We have escaped the corruption that's in the world. And he says, I want you to, for this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and the virtue with knowledge and the knowledge with self-control and the self-control with steadfastness and the steadfastness with godliness, and the godliness with brotherly affection, and the brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being, from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins." Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Wow. I like this one better. Doesn't that sound better than the parable of the sower? Because in the parable of the sower, it looks like, you know what, three-fourths of us are gone. We're just not going to make it. No, he's describing how difficult it's going to be. But understand, as he talks about the, the result, the fruit that happens with the sower, the fruit that happens with the spirit, the fruit that happens with the seven virtues is what this one is called. He's giving you, here's what happens. And so looking at it from Peter's perspective, he says, we make every effort, right? Not just, you know, oh, it's going to happen naturally. We make every effort, to have faith, to be able to get moral excellence, first step. Boy, if you can't get that, that's got to be one of the most difficult things. Got to be able to get your mind clear, your life clear, have the knowledge, this understanding. Self-control shows up again, being able to have self-control and keep yourself under control. Have a steadfastness that's the sticking with things, that you're not going to give up on Jesus. No matter how hard it gets, we don't quit. No matter what kind of rocks, no matter what kind of thorns, we are steadfast because we are going to stay with Jesus. Godliness is the attitude and character of God. It's what God is like, that he is love, that God is the one who's kind, that he's forgiving, that he's patient. And we develop this love and kindness and forgiving and patience in us as we develop and as we grow in this. 
the brotherly affection, that we love each other, that we care about each other. I like this one because this talks about the feeling that you have for each other. You know how you can feel close to some people? And he says, that's what this is. You're able to feel close to them because the last one is love. Well, wait a minute. I got brotherly affection and then I've got love? Yeah, the first one is brotherly affection. When you feel close to people, boy, what a great thing that is when we're able to share things in common with them. The last one is the love that he talks about is that you're going to love everybody regardless of who they are, friends or enemies. doesn't have to do with any emotion at all. The other one did. And so he says you develop each one of these things. And whoever lacks this fruit, the one who refuses to develop, the one where there's nothing going on under the surface, he says, even forgets that he was forgiven. He doesn't even remember that part anymore. But he says, if you're growing like this, if you're developing these things under the surface, if you're able to see this, you, you don't have to worry about it. You're not going to fall. Just practice these. Well, that sounds a whole lot better than losing 75%. I just, it's how we develop in Christianity. It's critical. It's crucial. We need to understand that that's one of the most important things that we do. Despite all the hard things in our life, despite all the good things in our life, despite all the chances and opportunities that we have, stay with Jesus. Stay with what he gives us. And it's when we develop a character like Jesus that it makes all the difference. All right, so why am I telling you this? I think we live in critical times. I think things are difficult. And we need to take the Word of God into our heart. That is the only way for us to develop this character of Christ. It makes us stronger. Is there anything happening beneath the surface? It's great to come and sit in the building, but these are hard times because we can't get together. It's harder to be together. It's harder to understand all of this. But I tell you what, we like to look back sometimes at those persecution times that we're able to see in the book of Acts, and we talk about how what great faith they had back then when they were thrown in prison and great faith they had when they had to worship in the catacombs and when they had all these difficulties and all these, they're rocks. And we can be those kind of people as well. Nobody's going to say this isn't a difficult time. But this is the time when you make it. This is the time when it matters. This is the hero time. When you're able to say, we never gave up. This is when we form maturity. Because now it matters more than ever. If it's just easy, we just all float along and say, well, yeah, we just do that because it's simple. Not so simple anymore. This is what matters. What makes big churches? Maturity. That's what makes big churches. We tend to focus on repentance and baptism, and we should. It's important. We need to do that. It's a first step. You don't get anywhere without it. You have to go back and do that. Don't develop all the rest of this like the house on the sand and say, well, what do I do now? You go back to the beginning. You start with repentance. You start with baptism. But boy, if we stay there, we're going to have nothing going on under the surface. There's got to be a way to develop this root. And it's when we start forming the maturity that he talks about, it makes everything work. And people who are looking from the outside want to see that this Christianity actually works. That people are able to be strong in the face of opposition. That we keep the people we disciple. 
And it all happens because the Word of God impacts your life. We don't let rocks get in the way. We form maturity because we have dealt with the rock. We deal with it every single day, and we will. But it is not going to get in the way. So how is the Word of God impacting your life? Are we able to get past all the hectic activity to real spiritual relationship with God? Let me encourage you this week to read your Bible with a pencil. Maybe you just need to start again and just say, I want to do this. And we need prayers to begin that. Or maybe you still need the repentance and the baptism. Would you come while we stand and sing and encourage each other? Oh